Thanks, Steve. Um, so quickly going through objectives, the things I want to focus on today is hopefully that after this presentation, everybody will be able to identify the purpose of gate rehab and the overall health for a patient post-CVA. Um, state variables in both stance phase and swing phase that decrease walking efficiency and identify impairments that cause a specific deviation in a hemiparetic patient and formulate a treatment plan using identified impairments during gait evaluation. So I'm going to talk about first, why is it so important to do gait rehabilitation after somebody has had a stroke? So the stroke is a leading cause of disability in the United States. Um, there's a significant relationship between physical inactivity and diseases, such as heart disease and diabetes. Um, so for the most part, after somebody's had a stroke, they have more difficulty walking. It leads them to be much more inactive. So people post-stroke walk less than 3,500 steps per day, um, and even the most sedentary adults are walking 5,000 steps per day. So they're walking a whole lot less than even very sedentary, um, healthy adults. Um, so our overall goal as therapists should be to return patients to being healthy individuals, being able to participate actively within their community. Um, so when they are walking, a, a person after having had a stroke, there's a high cost of energy. Um, and so ultimately it's decreasing their ability to, to participate in community events. Um, researchers have worked to find um, what specific biomechanical factors are really influencing why they have such a high cost of energy. Um, can we maybe use those specific biomechanical factors that they found to help to guide our rehabilitation with these patients? This is probably what I want to look at today. Um, there's been a, a few research, well, in my research, I was, I was going through what can we use gait analysis for the hemiparetic patient for, and there was a study done um, that talked about how it can help, a, a computerized gait analysis can help to guide Botox, possibly orthotic management, referral to physical therapy, even surgery, um, specifically how maybe which muscles are best to inject with Botox to make gait more efficient. Um, but then in, in this particular study, it did show that the clinical decision making for um, bracing or referral to physical therapy didn't change with um, computer gait analysis versus observational gait analysis, which I think is important for us as PTs that probably don't have computerized gait analysis to use on a regular basis with your patients. Um, so you, that observational gait analysis is valuable for maybe making bracing decisions or all, overall your plan of care as a physical therapist. Um, there's another study done that kind of went through what um, biomechanical factors might be causing a patient to have more falls after having had a stroke. So some of those things were smaller step lengths for the paretic versus non paretic limb, lower gait speed, um, lower gait smoothness in vertical and anterior posterior directions, larger variability in stride time and step length and paretic limb, and small margin of stability in the AP direction. We'll go into more details about kind of going through gait analysis with this. So kind of sped through that a little bit. Um, there's been a whole bunch of studies that kind of pointed to maybe two major contributing factors that make people less efficient walking post-stroke. So the first one is stance phase variables related to the propulsive force generating ability of the predic limb. So in that late stance, are they able to propel themselves forward? Um, some of those factors are how big their trailing limb angle is, what plantar flexion strength is like, and overall poor stability and hip and knee to kind of set them up for that um, late stance phase. Um, and overall deficits related to swing phase ground clearance. So those are kind of more obvious things. Is the patient able to get their leg through during swing phase? Are they too plantar flex? They're not flexing their knee or not flexing their hip enough. So I kind of want to go over this trailing limb angle because I'm going to talk a lot of that later. So if we're looking at um, this um, picture here, so we're looking at sort of where that hip is. Sorry, I'm going to get my pointer out for a second. <laughs> so we're looking at the, the in relationship to where the acetabulum is, to where the foot is making contact, and the angle perpendicular to the ground is the trailing limb angle. So you can see that the thigh is an extension. There should be a good... Um, you know, toe off at that point in time, the ground reaction force coming through the toe at this point is going to really help those plantar flexors propel or propulse that foot through the whole leg. 
You're also going to get a nice stretch on the iliacus or the hip flexors right here. So you're going to kind of get an automatic elastic stretch there. And with the plantar flexors pushing off, you should get pretty close to automatic hip and knee flexion with not a whole lot of act active muscle contraction having to happen. Um, so that angle, making sure you get that angle with a patient is really helpful in helping them kind of go back through or get their leg cleared. So the position of center of mass versus the foot is the trailing limb angle. So some studies were done on this increased trailing limb angle will biomechanically improve the ground reaction force to assist with propulsion from the ankle. We kind of talked about that one. And the overall propulsive force will aid in hip and knee flexion with minimal active contraction needed. It's going to improve the use of the iliacus versus rectus femoris by keeping um, your pelvis anteriorly rotated versus pelvis or posteriorly rotated. Um, and increased stretch on hip flexors for improved hip flexion through pre-swing and swing. So before I keep talking about gait, I think it's going to be helpful to kind of go through what a normal gait pattern is supposed to look like and kind of touch on some points that are something that very frequently in the hemipredic gait aren't normal. So I'm not sure why this guy's in a speedo, but you can see his legs really well. <laughs> so you see his nice initial contact, his knee and his hip, his hip is slightly flexed, his knee is pretty straight, pretty straight, and he and knee and hip and ankle through stance phase when he's in terminal stance. He's there to go through hip flexion, knee flexion through that pre-swing phase or flex and swing phase. Back up and watch it one more time. Okay. Uh, that's the wrong button, sorry. So uh, in this slide, I just kind of uh, go through really quick. Again, in that mid swing or in the mid stance phase, um, knee and hips should pretty much be neutral as well as the ankle. Um, in, and when you're going into terminal swing, knee and it, hips should be extended. Knee's gonna be pretty close to neutral. And then your ankle is going to be starting to go into plantar flexion. So two things I want to highlight. Your knee flexion in terminal stance should be somewhere between 0 and 5 degrees, and knee flexion in pre-swing should be somewhere between 50 and 70 degrees. All right. So now that everybody's primed to think about gait analysis, I'm going to show you a video of somebody that doesn't have a normal gait pattern to kind of think about. Sorry for all the delay. All right. So anybody want to throw out some gait deviations they're seeing with this gentleman? Knee hyperextension, circumduction. Yeah. Yeah. Hip hiking. OK, those are all good things. Um, let me show you another video. Very different than the last one, but also a hemipredic patient or hemipredic gait. Just keeping you in suspense. Here she is. <laughs> Anybody want to throw anything out about this gait? Definitely lack of hip extension. Shoes are awesome. My shoes look good, that's for sure. 
<laughs> All right. So they did a study um, trying, so there's, there's lots of studies done that try to kind of take lots of different gait impairments um, that a patient will have post-stroke. And this particular one looked at a cluster analysis, kind of comparing those other studies, did their own cluster analysis using, using EMG recordings, um, spatial temporal characteristics, and joint kinematics, and tried to classify, see if we could make a classification pattern for patients post-stroke to make it a little bit easier to kind of look at a patient, um, put them in a classification system, and that might help us a little bit to kind of see what the impairments really are to maybe guide what we're going to do treatment-wise. So they came up with four groups. One is a fast group, one was moderately or slightly flexed, one was flexed, and one was extended. Um, the N values there are how far away their velocity was from normal. We'll go through these each individually. There's a lot of words on this slide. So the determining factors of what put them into a group or clustered them was um, velocity being the biggest determining factor, terminal stance knee flexion, and pre-swing knee flexion. This study actually looked at um, patients one month after they had a stroke, and then again at six months. And those determining factors did change slightly, but not a whole lot. So the fast group, 67% of what a normal velocity should be. They're in four degrees knee flexion and terminal stance. Um, so pretty close to what they are supposed to be. And then normal knee flexion and pre-swing. So not too far away from normal, this fast group. So the motion pattern is they're going to look slightly decreased knee extension and mid stance, um, adequate dorsiflexion and swing, so they're, they're clearing their limb. The ankle dorsiflexion is excessive in, in terminal stance, so they're, they're a little bit flexed more than what they should be, um, and decreased thigh extension in terminal stance, so they're not getting as good of a trailing limb angle. The moderate group is 41% of normal velocity, so significantly more slow. Um, two degrees knee hyperextension in terminal stance. So they're, they're hyperextended in that last phase. 37 degrees knee flexion and pre-swing, so we're not flexed enough. So they're going to have trouble clearing their limb because their knee isn't flexed enough. The motion pattern is going to be pretty similar to group number one, except for those greater knee flexion in mid-stance. Ankle dorsiflexion is excessive in terminal stance and decreased thigh extension in terminal stance. Again, they're, so we're a little bit too flexed. We're not getting that good propulsive force in that circumstance. And overall, the EMG recordings of the knee, ankle, and hip extensor torque was decreased. So they're just kind of weak in those muscle patterns, or they're not recruiting those muscles as they should be in the gait pattern. So this video, I tried just for endlessly to try to get it to not be upside down, but it is upside down. So stick with me. <laughs> So this is really close to a normal gait pattern. Sorry that it's upside down. Um, you can see there's she's sort of flexed through the whole swing phase, more so in the whole stance phase, sort of more so than what she should be. Um, I'll give you one more look at that. But I would this this person I would put into that moderate category. All right. About the flex gait pattern. So the, the last two categories are much more significantly impaired. So the flex category is 10% of what normal velocity should be. Um, there's 18 degrees of knee flexion in terminal stance um, and 39 degrees in pre-swing. So they're way too flexed before they're going to push off and then not flexed enough when they're trying to swing or go, trying to clear their limb. They're excessively dorsiflexed in mid and terminal stance. There's weakness in hip extensors more so than knee extensors. And I think that's a point to really think about in this group. So th those patients are going to be the kind that the one of the videos I showed you earlier, they're going to look like they're crouched when they're walking. And I think a lot of people are going to look at that and say, I need to work at this, on this person's knee extensors because they are not straightening their knee out. But when they compare relatively their hip extensors versus their knee extensors, their hip extensors are actually much more weak than their knee extensors are. So if you're going to target one group, you're actually going to be better off targeting their hip extensors than their knee extensors for this type of gait pattern. Um, they're excessively flexed at all joints in stance with prolonged activity of quadriceps to help to support the knee flex posture. So their quadriceps are actually constantly firing because they're in that flex posture. They're not getting to the extended point where they can kind of turn that muscle off a little bit. They're so flexed that it's always on. So 
again, you really want to be looking, maybe you're going to strengthen both groups and knee extensors certainly are weak, but more, more so the knee extensors and the flexors, or I'm sorry, hip extensors and the knee flexors or knee extensors, sorry. Um, all right, so the last group is the extended group, also very slow, 11% of what a normal velocity should be. So the determining factors are seven degrees knee hyperextension in terminal stance and 18 degrees knee flexion in terminal stance. So way too extended as they're trying to swing their leg through and hyperextended in that push off phase. So the char other characteristics will be ankles dorsiflex. Ankle dorsiflexion is inadequate in terminal stance. They're plantar flex when they're going to push off. They're not, they're not even going to be able to get enough propulsive force because they're they're so plantar flex when they want to go to push off. Um, they have stronger hip extensors more so than knee extensors. So opposite of the flex group. Their knee extensors are, are weaker than what their hip extensors are. So these people go to take a step and they're actually hyper extending their knee because they're pushing back on their hip extensors so hard that they're just slamming back in the knee hyperextension. So they're excessively extended at ankle and hip and stance with prolonged activity of the biceps femoris in response to the knee hyperextension. So in those last two groups, the flexed and the extended group, um, this study felt that the tibial control from lack of plantar flexion strength is what sent them into these categories. So the relative hip strength of hip and knee extensors determine the gait pattern from there. So their plantar flexors are weak. They're causing their knee to either be flexed or hyperextended. And then how strong their hip or hip extensors or knee flexor or knee extensors were is what kind of put them into their category. And they're both very, very slow velocities compared to what the normal should be. In all of the groups, there's excessive knee loading. So there's a kind of, there's a study done about how in the hemiparetic patient, knees are getting worn down faster, much more likely to get osteoarthritis um, because there's so much loading on that knee because the knee, their muscles aren't kind of keeping them stabilized as they should. So I think that's important to keep in mind when you're rehabbing these patients and when they're talking about having knee pain it's something to pay attention to so in all the groups the impairments that were seen were that prolonged activity of the rectus femoris um, and specifically not related to spastic tone i think there's a tendency to think if they're if they're slamming back into knee extension or hyperextension and, and there's prolonged activity of the rectus femoris maybe not necessarily because of spasticity um, those with better adductor longus activation were able to attain a greater knee flexion angle despite prolonged rectus femoris activity by increasing the hip flexion effort, which increases knee flexion. So with that hip adductor longus, you're going to be able to keep the hip in a better direct, in a better position. So when it's in the right position, it's going to help to get knee flexion as you're coming through through swing phase. So the patients that did have that activating did better with their knee flexion through swing. Um, after that six month mark, so I, I said how the study kind of looked at one month after having a stroke and then six months. Um, after that six month mark, knee flexion is the limiting factor more than dorsiflexion in limb clearance. So this is another point I kind of want to talk about. A lot of times when you see a patient that's walking um, and they're catching their toes, everybody has a tendency to think, I need to get this person an AFO. We need to look at bracing. They're catching their toes. But um, a lot of times it's really because their knees aren't flexing or their hips aren't flexing. Their, their ankle might actually be in neutral dorsiflexion. And so adding an AFO to this person is not really going to help them with their limb clearance necessarily. Um, if it's helping with positioning of the knee, maybe, um, but maybe not rush to the conclusion that we need to get bracing right away for this person because the impairment isn't really necessarily at their ankle. Um, and the EMG recordings for the three slower groups, so the moderate, the flex, the extended, the hip and knee extensors, as well as the plantar flexors, were significantly reduced in all three of those groups. So when we're looking at strengthening, those are the muscle groups that we really want to hit. So let's go back and look at that extended gait pattern again with this gentleman. We got slow-mo. Here we go. Okay, so as he's walking in the stance phase, his forward progress is slow. You can see he's making initial contact 
at least flat foot, flat foot, if not forefoot. He's excessively plantar flex through the whole range. We're looking at his right leg too, by the way. Um, he's got decreased hip flexion and knee extension thrust um, and no trailing limb or not a really great trailing limb angle, probably could be better. He might not be a perfect example of that trailing limb angle, not being as good. Um, so was, that's really gonna slow his forward progression through stance phase. Um, his stability is overall affected, so excessive ankle inversion and a, and a contralateral pelvic drop. It's kind of setting him up for poor foot clearance, so that um, inadequate hip and knee flexion and pre-swing, you can see it's, he's pretty extended in pre-swing. When we look at his swing phase of gait, poor foot clearance, he's plantar flexed um, and not enough hip and knee flexion. And when he goes to swing his limb, his hip is abducted and backwardly rotated. In terminal swing, he's inadequate knee flexion or knee extension and hip flexion. I have that all written out. We can kind of see that as you're going through that gate video, what we can kind of pick out from there. So what are we going to focus on for treatment for this gentleman? Um, treatment one, is excessively, excessive inversion and plantar flexion through swing and initial contact at heel. So his ankle isn't right through swing phase. He's plantar flex and inverted. So to get him to clear his limb, maybe an AFO, maybe FES, um, those are some things you might want to consider. Treatment two is forward progression through stance. We said it's really slowed and, and kind of listed some of the reasons as to maybe why. So his knee extension and hip abduction strength is definitely something that we'd want to look at. So again, focusing on the knee extension strength and hip abduction just to kind of keep his pelvis steady as he's walking through. So his contralateral limb can take a nice long step. Um, and overall plantar flexion control. Slow that tibial advancement. Um, oh boy. Sorry. Um, and, and then, so strengthening the plantar flexors as well. And, and possibly range of motion. He might be limited in his range of motion, depending on how chronic this is, if he hasn't been maintaining the range of motion of his um, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. And then treatment three, we're looking at the trailing limb posture to set up for the swing phase or of, for the knee and hip flexion. So kind of preventing that external rotation, hip hike, using and making sure we're using the iliacus for the hip flexion. All right. So that was the extended group. Let's take a look at an example of the flex gate. All right. So in stance phase, not really great stability. Um, she's excessively dorsiflexed, her knee is flexed, her hip is flexed, um, and, and her loading response through terminal phase, she's kind of just flexed through the whole entire thing. With, and there should be some extension happening at both the hip and knee. Um, for progression is slow, so her initial contact is being made uh, probably foot flat, she's close to getting the heel first contact. Um, decrease, which is not a very good trailing limb angle, um, lack of a heel rise to push off, kind of like a forward rotation of her pelvis. So what's our treatment focus going to be for her? Um, we're going to talk about how, how is her still stability in stance or her forward progression. So strengthening her hip extensors, abductors, plantar flexors, knee extensors are going to help her progress her body through her um, stance phase and keep that contralateral limb from dropping so she can get a nice contralateral limb, limb step length. Treatment two is going to be looking at her limb advancement. So improve the trailing limb posture. So maybe an AFO to help to control that forward tibial translation. So she's a good example of somebody that she's not necessarily plantar flex through her swing phase, but during her stance phase, if we can get an AFO to kind of help to keep her from being so flexed, um, that we might be able to straighten out her knee a little bit more and, and help to kind of move, progress her um, through gait and then set up for a better trailing limb posture. And then strengthening, same as above, to help with the limb advancement. 
So I'm hoping by now somebody is thinking to themselves, but Betsy, I thought the only thing, so what we want to focus on is task specificity. So to get somebody better at walking, we need to get them walking. Then, you know, current concepts of neurologic rehabilitation. So why do I want to focus on what the joint kinematics are or what the impairments are during the gait cycle if all I need to do is be just walking this person, right? We don't want to do pre-gait activities because there's lots of research showing pre-gait activities don't really help somebody's gait. We need whole practice. We need to get the patient walking. Um, so to get better at walking, why is this important? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so um, the, these are some a lot of these are some very well supported interventions in literature. So repeated force use using body weight supported training, um, overground being superior to using a treadmill, um, bracing, electrical simulation, functional electric simulation, strengthening, motor learning, so making sure it's task specific, sorry, and using, making sure the patient has intrinsic versus ex extrinsic feedback. So they're determining whether they're making a mistake or not inside of themselves, not you telling them. And then, so we want to kind of talk about what the underlying principles of any neurologic rehabilitation. So looking at motor learning and neuroplasticity, you need to make sure that it's important to the patient. And I would say most patients are very motivated to get back to walking. So that's usually given. Um, task specific. So you want to get this person walking to get better at walking. Intensity. Lots and lots and lots and lots of walking, as many steps as we can get. Making sure there's a challenge. So patients need to be challenged beyond what they would normally do. Make sure it's internally initiated. Um, an external focus for cues and making sure you're giving the patient feedback. So I kind of want to go through some of those things specifically and what the literature has to say about those interventions as far as gait rehab is concerned. Um, so intensity alone is not enough for neuroplastic changes and motor learning. The best thing to get better at walking is going to be walking. So doing the, again, doing pre-gait activities are probably not going to help the patient get better at walking. Walking has to help for walking. Um, intensity, so the more steps you get in a session, the better. So it takes 400 to 600 repetitions re required for skill acquisition and to facilitate neuroplastic changes in the brain. So lots and lots and lots of steps. Making sure there's a challenge for the patient. So there's a strong, consistent association of rehabilitation activities that challenge patients and stress them well beyond their current level, which will correlate to better outcomes. This specific study looked at um, actual transfer training um, for patients in the hospital in, in rehab. So looking at um, sit to stands. So the patient making them do it without using their hands versus the patient will always use their hands and do all sorts of comp compensatory patterns when left to do it on their own or what they might be doing when you're not there. But if you force them to do it, they can do it and they do, they do better. So really forcing them to challenge themselves. And then internal versus an external focus for cues. I think this is an important one to talk about too. So an external focus improves accuracy and muscle recruitment versus internal focus. So this has been shown to be true for motor learning for the healthy athlete. And it also applies to um, a patient that's had a stroke. So for example, if somebody's walking, you see they're not extending their knee through the stance phase. Um, tempting to say, make sure you straighten out your knee to the patient. It, that's a very internal cue. That's an internal focus for them. Um, if you tell them, try to push your knee back, like you're going to push it to the back of the chair, then they're going to be able to do it better than if they have the internal focus of, I need to straighten my knee out. Maybe another example of this could be, so their contralateral limb isn't taking a long enough, or isn't a, a long enough step. So you can say to them, take a longer step. That's kind of an internal cue. If you tell them, step past your opposite foot, then that's going to be an external cue. So they can kind of look at their opposite foot and take that opposite step or take a longer step. All right, so strengthening. So it's a lot of the older research um, indicated that strengthening will definitely help a, a patient's gait get better and, and they'll be more efficient with it. A lot of the newer research is not necessarily supporting that. Um, so this specific, this is a, it's called a step study, um, the Sullivan et al. one. So this one looked at patients doing body weight supported treadmill training for half of their session of physical therapy. And then the other half of their session, they were doing strengthening. Um, and, and those patients did not show as good of outcomes as a comparison group that did body weight supported treadmill training alone. 
So I think that highlights the fact that when you have your patient in in the session doing and you're trying to get their walking better, you got to get them walking. And, and so maybe not breaking up your session doing a whole lot of strengthening might not to be any advantage. There was another study that showed a patient doing intensive locomotor training while they were in therapy. Um, and, and that was it. I think it was three days a week. They came in, they did a whole lot of walking. Um, they compared that to a group of patients that went home and just did a really intensive home exercise program, strengthening, balance, um, and transfer training. Um, and actually the, the patients that did the intensive home exercise program did better than the patients that were doing the locomotor training at physical therapy. So that kind of changes a little bit of what I, I had just said before, but I think it underlines the fact of how important your home exercise program is. So when you go do your gait analysis and you see <clears throat> which muscle groups are not firing well and that that's gonna set you up for, okay, this is the muscles that we need to do strengthening on. Let's set up a really good home program. Let's make sure they're doing an intensive home program of strengthening on those muscle groups. And then maybe when they come into physical therapy, we can really focus on that locomotor training. So in this study, the home exercise group didn't do any locomotor training and the locomotor training didn't do any home exercise program. I think we combine the two, it should be helpful. So that's what a follow-up of that study did. So they combined the two and then they compared um, the group of patients that were doing the locomotor practice during physical therapy and then the intensive home exercise at home compared to usual care physical therapy. So probably doing some pre-gate activities, kind of more what we would typically think of for physical therapy um, and compared those two. And the, the patients in the home exercise program with the intensive locomotor training um, at physical therapy versus the usual care physical therapy did much better. So then at the end of that study highlighted a standardized, progressive, goal-oriented and individualized home exercise program and locomotor training program delivered with substantial frequency, intensity, and duration were more effective in improving functional walking ability than PT provided according to current usual practices. So there was another study done that showed um, patients do very well when you give them feedback about how their performance is, um, which is one of the you know, cornerstones of motor learning, feedback. So daily feedback of um, this, this study showed every time that a patient came in to PT, at the end of their session, they did a gait speed on the patient. So every single time the patient got feedback about how they were performing and, and if they were improving. And they had really great outcomes with those patients because they were getting constant feedback about if they're improving or if they were not improving. So I think that's something easy to kind of incorporate every time you see a patient, do a quick gait speed, tell them what it is, tell them what it was last time. Then they can know if they're progressing or they're not progressing. Um, and functional electric stimulation. So there's been lots of research on that. So combining treadmill walking with functional electric stimulation um, applied to the plantar flexors and dorsiflexors for post-stroke patients resulted in greater anterior ground reaction forces, which is kind of what we had talked to about be before would be helpful. So you're setting up that greater trailing limb angle. You're going to get a good propulsive force from the plantar flexors with the FES. And then you're kind of overall just creating a really as normal walking pattern for the patient as you can using the functional electric stimulation. It would be really cool if we could, our systems that I know that we have within the St. Luke's outpatient sites are BioNess and it only works on dorsiflexors, but considering how important we're kind of learning that the plantar flexors are, I think it would be something cool to look into that could really help our patients. Um, but even the FES for dorsiflexors is also proven to be helpful. So a recent systematic review showed that FES produced increases in muscle strength and voluntary range of motion when used during walking in individuals post-stroke. Again, likely because you're getting them back to the most biomechanically normal walking pattern that you can. So they're kind of going to build up their other muscle strength and recruitment because they're getting to a, a more normal pattern. So this is the same slide I had showed you earlier about um, the current literature that's supported um, for interventions for gait training. So I highlighted those red ones because all of those things point to the fact that when you're seeing your patient and you're trying to do gait rehab with a patient after they've had stroke, the best thing to do is get them walking and get them walking as much as you can during your session that you're seeing them. Um, so out of those things, you're gonna choose to get them walking in whatever way that you can. So using your gait analysis, you can kind of decide what of those other 
interventions you're going to try. So bracing, functional electric stimulation, what sort of strengthening, which muscle groups are you going to target? Um, what sort of extrinsic feedback you can give the patient to get their walking to the most normal biomechanical advantage that they can, and maybe what challenge to provide um, to maybe work on those muscle groups as a pattern that's not quite right. So if you get them by using these interventions, walking as good as you can, you're going to be working on task-specific repetition. You're going to increase their intensity. You're going to increase their internally initiated cues to write themselves during their gait pattern. So by making good selections based on the impairments you've seen in gait observation, you'll be able to improve repetition, intensity, and internal initiation. So during their gait training, you can kind of work on some of those other um, principles of, of neural rehab that we talked about before. So giving them frequent feedback about their performance, um, giving them external focus of cues, challenge them before beyond their normal participation that we would do, and making sure it's important to the patient. So I kind of put that all on one slide. So during your treatment session, you're choosing to have them walk. You're going to figure out how to get them most biomechanically to what biomechanical advantage you can to to get them in the best walking pattern. You're going to increase their task-specific repetition, increase intensity, and make sure they're internally initiated by doing that. And then you can kind of use those other things on the bottom to help guide that and make it better as they're practicing. A quick video I want to show. So this gentleman, we watch his left leg. He's probably in that extended gait pattern, making forefoot initial contact, his knees coming back into hyperextension. Um, he's definitely plantar flexed through his gait cycle. So anybody have any ideas of what they feel like they might try to do with him to improve his, his gait while he's walking? Bracing, yeah, definitely. Anybody else? Maybe what, what, what groups of muscles might you strengthen? Hip extensors, yeah. Definitely knee extensors too, right? Because he's in that extended gait pattern. So same gentleman, different day. We put um, the bioness on him. So helping him kind of, kind of like bracing. Um, here he is. You can see still not perfect for sure, but he's definitely getting better limb clearance um, by just getting his dorsiflexors up. So we're really increasing how many repetitions he's able to do walking. We've got him on the treadmill. He's going a lot faster. He's getting a lot more steps in. Um, he definitely could definitely use a improvement in his calf muscle strength to propel his leg forward. It's going to help him really clear his knee and deflection and his hip as well. You can't really see it in this video. Um, but yeah, so kind of by looking at your gait analysis, you decided like AFO, FES, and then you can kind of work on it from there. And that's it. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's you no know, definitely an important thing to keep in mind when you're doing your initial evaluation is to look at what what the tone pattern is, what the joint range of motion availability is. Um, so for, yeah, if I think that somebody's hip flexors are just really tight to begin with, they're high tone in their hip flexors, they don't have good joint range of motion to begin with, then I'm going to get them set up on a home program to make sure that they are definitely stretching that because certainly if they can't get their joint to hip extension to begin with, then they're really going to have a hard time when they're walking. Does that answer? Anybody else? No? Okay. Thank you.